right, hello everyone. A recent survey on the state of data management found that 77% of IT decision makers don't trust the data they use to make decisions. What's more, 91% said they need to improve data quality at their organization. Now, how many of you here have ever experienced data quality issues? All of you. It's a little bit of a biased sample because you showed up to this talk. But what these statistics here and what's happening here in the room represent is really the new reality today. Namely, that it's no longer an issue of how big, diverse, or distributed your data is. It's that you can't trust it. My name is Vicky Andanova, and I'm a leader on the machine learning team at Anomalo. Anomalo is a data quality monitoring platform, and our main goal is to help companies trust the data they use to make decisions. Now, creating and scaling that trust is exactly what we'll talk about today. So how did I get here? I've spent the last four years thinking deeply about the problem of data quality, but it wasn't always so top of mind for me. My first job in data was actually teaching young professionals as they made the career switch into data science. So I spent a lot of time in academic data sets. It wasn't until I joined Instacart where I realized the impact that data quality can have, not just on machine learning teams and data teams, the productivity on the team, but on the organization as a whole. Now, because Instacart doesn't have its own inventory, everything from what items we predicted would be in stock, who we think we should send to go shop for them, how much we should pay for them, how much we should charge for the items, and when we thought the items would show up at your doorsteps. These were all data decisions. So when data quality became unreliable or degraded, it impacted our, way, our ability to improve revenue. So I personally spent a lot of time playing whack-a-mole with these data quality issues. And, but nothing, nothing I was doing was scaling well. So this inspired me to join our co-founders at Anomalo and help solve this issue, not just for me and my company, but for all companies across many, many different industries. Now today, we'll talk about data observability and data quality, what they are and how they differ. We'll define what effective data quality monitoring looks like. We'll look into three ways for monitoring data quality. And then zoom in on an unsupervised machine learning example and the algorithm behind it. Now, how many of you have heard the terms data observability and data quality? A lot of you. Chances are, if you've ever had data quality issues, or you've begun even thinking about solving this problem, you've heard these two terms used interchangeably. The problem is that they don't actually mean the same thing. Data observability is monitoring how data is moving throughout your organization. That means monitoring the metadata, monitoring the jobs that are causing the data to arrive, and some sort of lineage to identify the impact of an outage. Now, this is great and obviously foundational. You need to have data, <laughs> and you need to know it's arriving on time. But most of you know it's not enough to have data to make better decisions. You need to have good quality data. So in walks data quality monitoring. Now we're actually querying the contents of the data that arrived. We're opening the box and we're checking what the quality of that data is. It usually involves defining what good quality means and then making sure that the data aligns with that. Now in reality, you need both of these to work together in order to have a comprehensive solution. But because defining what quality means usually takes data quality, data experts, and which we all know our data experts are one, expensive, two, hard to come by, scaling this method is much, much harder. So that's where we're gonna focus here for the rest of our time today. First, let's define what makes for effective data monitoring. To be effective, data quality monitoring must be easy. It must be easy to set up and easy to execute. It must be interpretable. You must know exactly what happened when you get an alert here. It must be scalable. It needs to be able to scale to billions of rows or thousands of columns. And it must be sensitive. So you must be able to find a small of a change that you care about. And finally, it must be comprehensive. So you need to be able to identify any type of issue that can occur on your data, not just the things you can think of or conceive of happening. 
So what methods do we have at our disposal? You can broadly group these into three uh, buckets. The first one is the most simple one. These are validation rules. These are hard and fast expectations you have of your data. So this could be a column is never null, or an ID column is always unique. Now they require you tell them the table, the column you care about, the type of rule you want to apply, and some sort of constraint. Now that could be always null, oh sorry, never null, always unique, but that could also be something like only know up to 2% of the time if there is some noise in your data. Now these are great because they're very easy to understand, but data is not static. So as it changes over time, the data experts that set these up need to come back and edit these constraints. So for example, if the 2% was found to be too low, someone needs to come back in and edit it and maintain it over time. So how do we improve on this? Uh, in walk metric anomalies. Now. Uh, these are your big company KPIs that you're likely already tracking in your BI tools. They're great because they're familiar, uh, but they still require some input. They require a table, a column, or columns that you need to monitor, and the way you define a metric. What's great about these, though, is now the constraint is auto-generated. This usually involves some sort of predictive interval or confidence interval that is machine learning generated and changes over time as your data changes. Now again, great because these are very familiar and easy to understand, but at scale, once you start monitoring thousands of these, because you're using a predicted interval or confidence interval, the false positives start to scale exponentially. Now, false positive is bad, we all know that, but what is the real impact of a false positive and why does it matter? Actually, when you're dealing with data quality or implementing some sort of a data quality solution, False positive is the biggest thing you should be caring about. Why? Because it leads to alert fatigue. And what does alert fatigue mean? So over time, as your experts are trying to, you implement a data quality solution because you want them to spend more time doing what they're experts at. And as you're bogging them down with more and more alerts where they have to kind of sift through noise to understand which is real, which is just a false positive, they ultimately end up not only not trusting the data, but also not trusting your data monitoring system, which, is, which you've invested a lot of resources to implement. Now before we move on to what number three is, let's see how these stack up on our rubric. Now are they easy to set up? I wouldn't say so. You have to add some, a lot of manual input here, right? Interpretable? Great here. It's very easy to understand what happened. You have your KPIs that you already are familiar with. Are they scalable? Again, not really, because you have to maintain validation rules over time, and because metric anomalies don't scale well on thousands of metrics, they really don't do well here. Are they sensitive? Now, validation rules are the best at this. Even if just one record is null and the is never a null validation rule, these will fire. Metric anomalies, on the other hand, because it's an aggregate, because it requires some sort of confidence interval around it, they're not as good, but you can tune that and you can get them to a place where you're happy with them. But finally, are they comprehensive? This is probably the biggest issue with these um, methods. It requires me or the data expert to set these up manually and tell the system what to look for. That means you always have this universe of unknown unknowns that you're susceptible with, too. So when a new issue arises, you have to, one, identify it somehow. Hopefully that's not because your executive told you about it. You have to root cause it. You have to now come back in here and set up yet another validation raw metric to maintain over time. So to combat that, at Anomalo, we've created a third category, which is our unsupervised data monitoring. Now these are machine learning models that just point at a table, learn what is normal for that table, and alert you if it ever deviates from that normal. Um, I sound too good to be true, and for that reason, we're gonna spend the rest of our time here, so to show you a little bit about how these work behind the scenes and build the intuition behind them. So let's take a look at an example. Here, I have a set of ticket sales data. Each row here is a unique sales. You can see that this last one here is a concert from The Who, that's happening in Houston, Texas. 
There's some confused faces out there on who the heck the who is, <laughs> but that's fine. We're going to move on. They're banned. Um, if you scroll down, you can learn a little bit more about the data itself, what the columns are and the column types, and the most common values for each one of these. Further, you will find our table, our table homepage. Across the top, you'll see a data freshness, data volume. These are the data observability sections. In the bottom, you'll see key metrics validation rules. We went over what those are. And in the middle, you'll see kind of our secret sauce. You can see that unlike key metrics and validation rules, they require no setup and come out of the box. So let's, let's break the data. How many of you have heard of the Netflix Chaos Monkey? I love it. This is more than usual. So the Netflix Chaos Monkey is actually one of my favorite things. It's the system that Netflix uses to build resilient and reliable systems in production. So the Chaos Monkey goes in and randomly shuts down different produ production instances. At Anomalo, we have the Chaos Llama. And you might have guessed it. The Chaos Llama goes in and introduces random issues into your data. Now we use this for demonstrations like this, but we also use it deeply in, develop in development and making sure that our models are catching all the issues that we can think of occurring. So in this case, I'm going to go in and introduce some chaos to the data. I'm going to change a value of the columns. I'm going to select our table. I'm going to change the price per ticket column and introduce a big sale because I personally love concerts and I hate paying a lot of money for them. So I'm going to say all tickets are going to be $10. I'm going to do that for 30% of records. But hoping it would slide under the radar, I'm only going to do this in New York because that's where I was and I just want to sell on my tickets. <laughs> you just select the time column in there. And then we can go back into the table, uh, in the table homepage. We can select our passing check. We saw everything was passing before, and we're going to run it uh, again. So now you can start seeing the execution. You can see it will sample the data. It will build the machine learning models. And finally, we'll visualize exactly what is happening. And if we go back out, we'll see that this check failed without ever knowing the issue I introduced into the data. If you click into it, you can see that the model correctly identified that price per ticket value 10 increased. You see that it classified this as a strong anomaly compared to the learned threshold. And remember that learned threshold, we'll come back to it. Down further, you'll see the distribution of values and how they've changed. And then finally, you'll get a sample of the good and bad rows. So here, as a data scientist, I can grab that blue dot and kind of scrub through the data to see if there are any patterns I can identify in the good or the bad data. But is this enough? Can I stop here? The problem with this is that if I was lucky, I would, now ha I would have to go in and query the data to try to find the segments of the data that are affected or root cause the issue. If I was lucky, I might have picked up the fact that this is something with the venue state column and visualize all the states and find the issue. But if I wasn't lucky or if there were many categories and segments in the data, this could take me days or weeks. So what's cool about these models is they also bring up an automated root cause that you can see correctly identified that venue state, cases when venue state is equal to New York, are disproportionately responsible for this issue. Now, in the interest of time, I might speed through this, but you can always find me after and ask questions. Let's look at the algorithm at a high level. So to do this, we take a sample of yesterday's data and today's data, and we try to see if there's a material change between the two dates. Now, that's not really a machine learning problem. So in order to reframe it, we ask the question, can we predict which date each record came from? Now, that allows us to create a response column of zeros and ones. We also auto-encode all of the columns to create this feature matrix. And with our feature matrix and our response column, we can now build a gradient boost in decision tree. Now, in the case where you see here, uh, where the, the model starts learning and continues learning over time, that's a good case. That means the model is able to separate the two samples and understand there's some fundamental difference between them. 
But on the other hand, you might have a case where it starts in just flat lines. That means the model is just throwing up its hands and saying, I don't know what you're asking me to do here. These two samples are exactly the same. And that indeed is what happens. They're exactly the same. There's nothing to learn. In this case, we take the, what the model has learned and try to identify which values specifically, sorry, there we go, which values specifically contributed to this prediction. So we drill down to the row column combination that impacted this. Because of this, we're able to then power the visualizations and get and explain in natural language exactly what happened and show you all the things like the root cause analysis. Now there's no free lunch. <laughs> there are challenges to this uh, approach that we had to we had to account for and that you should account for if you're thinking about something similar. First is seasonality. If a change only always occurs on Mondays, Monday will always look anomalous compared to Sundays. So you need to actually build several of these models to account for seasonality. There are time correlated features that will always predict which date something came from. Now those are date columns, but also auto incrementing ID columns. There's also chaotic tables that are by nature more chaotic than others. That is what that learn threshold was. So for those, you would want to only alert if a table exceeds its base level of chaos. Also in data, there's rarely a case where an issue impacts just one column. So you need to intelligently cluster these issues and only alert once to prevent alert fatigue. These need to scale. These are big models that need to scale to thousands of columns and billions of rows. So we actually sample here. And finally, the last issue is accuracy. So these need to be sensitive to real changes, but also be able to scale. And because of this, actually, let's move to the next. We'll talk about that in a second. Let's see how these stack up on our rubric. Are they easy? Absolutely. No need to set them up, just point at a table. Interpretable, because of the way we assign chat values to the value in the table. These are very interpretable and explainable. Are they scalable? Again, we've sample here to allow for scalability. For sensitive, this is the part I just skipped for a second because I knew we were talking about it here. These, this is probably the biggest Achilles heel of these approaches. Because you're sampling, you can end up in a case where you just miss by random chance the long tail of a change. The good news about that is validation rules, literally the simplest of all approaches, are the best at this. So in reality, we, we tell users to turn these on for every single one of their tables and enhance with validation rules and metrics where they really, really care about a certain business critical table. And finally, comprehensive, because I didn't tell the system exactly what to look for or what I personally cared about, these are not marred by unknown unknowns. They're looking for any changes in the data and will alert you on them. So I'd like to leave you with two things to think about today. First, think about the state of data quality at your organization today. If you're a data professional, how do you feel deploying a new model or sending an analysis to an executive or a client? If you're an executive or a client, how do you feel about interpreting those analyses? If it doesn't align with your instinct, are you tempted to just go with your gut because data has been wrong before? On the other hand, think about how you would feel if you had some of these models looking for unknowns, unknowns, unknown unknowns in your data or checking exactly every single value is correct. Now, how do you feel sending that analysis? And how do you feel receiving and interpreting those? Now, if any of this made you excited or motivated to implement these, please come find me after. I'm happy to take some questions or stop by our booth to see how Anomaly can work on your data. Thank you.